We're finding out that many of our viewers have hobby greenhouses. Now obviously we're not in a hobby type greenhouse. We're in the teaching greenhouses here on the OSU campus and we're going to talk to you a little bit about integrated pest management and joining us today is Dr. Mike Snelly. Mike, welcome. Thank you. Mike is one of our assistant professors here on campus and Mike deals with the commercial greenhouse industry as well as the ornamental industry and Mike you're even doing a videotape I understand about IPM in the commercial greenhouse. Now Mike tell us to start with what is integrated pest management? Integrated pest management Steve is basically looking at uh, reducing pesticide usage through other types of devices or means to reduce pest and disease problems in a greenhouse, in a nurture, any type of ornamental setting. Uh, we don't want to get rid of pesticides, we want to use them judiciously and with a little common sense and reduce their usage. Uh, and IPM is really not a term just for greenhouses, like you said, it can be used in a home garden or anything. And Mike, one thing that I've noticed too is I kind of like to look at it um, kind of as a puzzle, pieces of the puzzle. And we're going to give you a three-part series talking about cultural, mechanical, and biological. And today, Mike, we're going to just address cultural practices. And really the key to it, though, is proper conditions in a greenhouse. Why don't you touch on that just right. a little bit? The first thing, like you alluded to, is having the plants healthy to start with. If they have a high resistance, they're in good shape, they're growing like they should be, then a lot of your problems will never exist, such as disease or insect problems. So uh, using the right cultural techniques and keeping them healthy, right temperature, right humidity, right watering schemes uh, will go a long ways in, in reducing any problems to start with. And that's proper sunlight, all those things that they would need right. to check with on a greenhouse to start with, I guess before they'd ever, ever construct it or anything exactly. like that. Exactly. Now you alluded to healthy plants. Talk to us a little bit about what happens if some start getting sick or we see a dead leaf or those types of things. What should we try to do? Okay, a couple things. Let's take a look at this Diffenbachia, for example. Uh, some of the lower leaves have fallen off here. That could be a result of uh, many inst or cases that could be going on. Let's assume, though, there's a disease going on in this plant. A couple things you want to do is keep those lower leaves or the affected leaves pulled off, get rid of them, burn them, bury them, whatever. Uh, leaving a plant that uh, has problems with diseases or insects is just likely to spread that problem throughout your greenhouse or any of your growing areas that you may have. That's your first thing you want to think about then is keeping your plants clean from any affected areas they may have. If one should get in severe case though, should they try to pamper it, pull it out, or should they pitch it? I guess it all depends on the type of plant, those things, but what could happen there? Yeah, it's basically a, a judgment call that each uh, person has to make, but if you have a lot of money invested, the best thing to do is just to get rid of an unhealthy plant. It'll save you a lot of heartache in the long run with uh, disease or insect okay. problems. Or isolate it maybe from some yeah. of their other health That's issues. That's the key right there. If you're bringing in a new plant, make sure that it doesn't have insects or disease problems before you put it in with a community setting like we have right here right. on this bench. Uh, take a look and be certain that it's not going to spread any problems. That'll go a long ways in keeping your house uh, clean and healthy. Okay. Mike, talk to us a little bit about the floors in a greenhouse. Okay. There's a lot of problems created from that. Right. A couple things to keep in mind. The first line of defense is to have a floor that's not going to have muddy spots or areas. It can splash up when you're watering or they get on your feet and you splash as you walk through the greenhouse. That'll spread disease problems. You can see here that we have a concrete floor that will go a long ways in sanitation and preventing any disease problems from occurring. Okay. What about like weeds or algae that might show okay. up in a greenhouse? Try to keep all the weeds out and also weeds out outside of the greenhouse, mow, pull, or whatever you need to do. In terms of algae, there are chemicals you can use. The best thing for algae, though, is to keep uh, your floor or even your bench surfaces dry when possible, and algae won't exist in the first place. And a lot of it is watering, isn't it? What, what kind of watering practices as far as the hose and times of day should we? Yeah. Water early in the day to allow the foliage to dry off towards uh, nightfall. That's when you get cooler temperatures and diseases are more likely. Also, an easy thing to forget to do, and we're all guilty of that, is to not to hang up the end of the hose after watering. If you put it down on that floor, even if you think the floor is clean, that's a good way to pick up disease problems that you then spread the next uh, irrigation. Okay. And Mike, it, it doesn't apply so much, I think, with some of our foliage, but it does with vegetables and people smoking in a greenhouse. Touch yeah. on that real quickly. Uh, smoking is a bad thing to do in the greenhouse. If you must smoke, be outside. It okay. can spread disease problems. Okay. Well, that's a good point. And Mike, I think 
to start out with everybody, we're just saying keep it clean, sanitation, right. and we hope to bring you some other parts here about mechanical and biological, so stay tuned. And Mike, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And while we're in the greenhouse, let me go show you some unusual and not so common indoor plants that you might want to look at this time of year. Well, we're all familiar with the outdoor maple, which is, some of them are native to Oklahoma, but did you realize that there was also an indoor flowering maple? Well, other than the common name, there's really no other comparisons. They're not even in the same genus. This particular one is often referred to as parlor maple or indoor flowering maple. And the reason that it got that name is obviously because of the shape of the leaf, which is a maple shape. This particular variety is variegated with an orangish colored flower. And these are great indoor plants as long as you've got a high intensity or bright window where you get a lot of light. They require an awful lot of light, so it's a poor selection for poor light. The plant is very aggressive. The, the leaves are really a velvety touch. And they need to be cut back, which we've done on this one here, to stimulate some side branching and to keep it bushy. I have seen them anywhere from three to four feet, depending upon how you train it. Again, it's high light requirements, and there's other varieties now. Some of them have white flowers, some a pinkish red, and even some that are yellow flowers. And then, of course, you'll get variation in the foliage with a completer or a darker green. But it's a nice plant to give us a little bit of unusual flower type that kind of looks like a hibiscus in a way. Now another interesting plant that is a new variety is peace lily. And this particular cultivar is called petite tasson or tasson. And it's, peace lily is not a new plant because we're familiar with it in, in low light areas in the home. But this one is different because you'll notice the leaves are very narrow and strap-like as well as the flower spike compared to the one that we're kind of familiar with with the larger leaves and, and you can see there's a huge difference in the size of the foliage. Now this variety is a petite one which grows lower. This one is bushy and again the main differences are the narrow foliage but what I want to bring to your attention is these are the flower spikes and they're not white like you would normally see them and the reason for that is when they first emerged they were white but if you've noticed the pistil or the center part that produces the pollen, sometimes as it dries and ripens, it will fall off in the foliage and get powdery. And a lot of you've seen that. And what I do is I go in and I cut that out after it's been in full bloom for a while so that doesn't happen, so I don't have to wash the foliage off. And what happens is the chlorophyll will then proceed and grow into the uh, flower spike and it will turn white to a green color. Now another way this will occur is if you get it in too much sunlight. So again it's low light and you'll see some of the flower spikes starting to show up here that are the true white color with the pollen tube. So it's a neat little delicate plant. These are some great and unusual plants for this time of year and be sure and check your greenhouses during the winter time and your garden centers because a lot of new and unusual plants start showing up and they're great selections and make good Christmas gifts. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. You can also find more recent videos on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.